I had one law student tell me that she was so upset because in her constitutional law class, the professor announced at the beginning of the year there was one area of the Constitution they weren't going to study, the First Amendment, and they didn't study it the whole year. When I was in college and law school, the First Amendment was the key thing that we learned. And that's the right to protest, the right to free speech. So they're dumbing down the population so they won't even think about that. Very welcome uh, to the Herland Report, uh, John Whitehead. You are a constitutional attorney who has defended so many in this country against police brutality uh, over the years and many other offenses. You are one of the nation's leading voices for the return, for the respect for the American Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are also an acclaimed author Mm -hmm. One of your books, we're going to talk about that now, is The Battlefield America, uh, and a very interesting treatise mm -hmm. on what has happened in American uh, social life. Uh, would you elaborate, please? America today, to be honest with you, is if I go back uh, 30 years, is a totally different country. And much of it has come with the militarization of the, of the local police in this country. Uh, local police today, be, through a federal program called the 1033 program, which Donald Trump has uh, said he will enhance as well and give more military gear to policemen, uh, supposedly they were getting used materials from Afghanistan and stuff like that. And I'll go through that in more detail. But as I did my research, I found about 40% of the material was new. So they're buying it, new materials. So the large corporations are making a lot of money off of it. But the material that a policeman have today are heavy Kel Kel uh, Kelvar helmets, vests, they dress in black, they have all kinds of automatic weapons, they have sniper scopes. The equipment that police have today, local police, these are just local in small towns, they have stingray devices, which are small little boxes that fit in a police car. They pull it in front of your home, they can download everything from your phone, your, your cell phone and your laptop, know everything you're doing. They have vans, by the way, which actually can actually do a scan on your home to see if who's moving in your home in there, and they do that on a regular basis. This is in America. And that, combine that with the SWAT teams, which there are 80,000 occurring annually in America. It used to be about 3,000 in the 1980s, where they're crashing through people's doors in the middle of the night. Kids have actually been killed. There was the case of Island Jones in Detroit, where the police crashed through an apartment building on an upper level, went through the, went through the windows and the doors, and they were after some fellow, some man supposedly, a crook. One of the policemen actually said he tripped and his gun went off. Ianna Jones was 10 years old. She was laying, African American girl, laying on her couch in her prince's blanket. The bullet went through her and killed her. The blood splattered all over the floor. Her father came out screaming, wondering what happened and fell down. It was basically in her blood. And what happened was the police were in the wrong apartment. The fellow they were looking for was several floors up, but she died. Uh, that was a SWAT team raid gone awry. And the key is, I've gone back, as we've talked about so far, is our Bill of Rights says there's a Fourth Amendment. You're not supposed to be doing that in America. It says, you ha before you go in somebody's home or even approach their porch to knock on their door, you're supposed to have a, a legal document, a warrant, saying you can do that. Today, they're just crashing through people's doors. Girls are getting killed. There was a case of Jose Guerrero, who was a former veteran of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And the police were supposedly in Arizona. It was an Arizona neighborhood in America, in the state of Arizona. They were doing a sweep of the neighborhood trying to find people using marijuana. Well, they picked on Jose Guerrero in his home, went through it in the middle of the night. Remember, this is a former veteran. He had one gun in his home, a shotgun. He took his wife, he thought burglars had entered the home. He took his wife and daughter and put them in the closet behind him, stood at the end of his hallway with his rifle. The police fired over 70 times, hitting him 50 sometimes. He collapses, is bleeding to death. His wife comes out screaming for medics to help him. The police will not let the medics help him. He bleeds to death on his floor. The police were in his wrong home. He had no marijuana in his home. That was a, a SWAT team raid gone awry. 
So what happened to those policemen? Very seldom are the police ever prosecuted. I've been on a number of cases where when they get in the courts, the courts give them what they call qualified immunity. In other words, they say the police were just trying to do their job. But what kind of signal does that send to the police? That sends that the police could do anything they want to do. That's basically what it does, yes. And the courts do that routinely. There was a case that I personally handled where, and this is, again shows you uh, the paranoia of the government. They're doing total surveillance. There's a program called Operation Vigilant Eagle run by the government. It watches all returning veterans from foreign wars to see if they're disgruntled. Many of them can't own rifles. They don't let them have, you come back from a war and fighting for America, you can't own a hunting rifle in America if you're a veteran. Well, the fellow that we helped with was a 26-year-old veteran who had just gone, finished jogging in the morning. He didn't have a shirt on. He had a business at home he was typing. He hears a noise outside. He runs to the window and looks out. There's cars pulling up like SWAT team people and federal agents running up. One, one, some happened to be from the FBI. And he said, what's up? And they said, we've been reading your Facebook post. He was against Obama's executive orders. And he you know, was very outspoken. He's a 9-11 truther which is, there's millions of people in the United States that believe that 9-11 was fabricated by the government. He believed that. He was, uh, they asked him to step out. He did not own a weapon at all. They asked him to step out on the porch. He did. They handcuffed him. They took him to the van. This is a client that I helped defend. They, they slammed him against the fence and ripped his back open. He got to the police station. He asked for a bandage. They put one of those prison shirts on him. And he said it hurt so bad because he got in the crack in his back. But him being a 9-11 truther, he was given a five-minute uh, examination in a jail cell by a psychiatrist who said because he was a 9-11 truther, he might be mentally ill. He was given a short hearing by a magistrate who was 70-some years old who did not keep a record of the hearing. And he was placed in a mental hospital. Here's the key. Those are called civil commitments in America. And this fellow happened to live in Virginia, the state of Virginia. There's 20,000 civil commitments annually in Virginia, 1.5 million annually, where people in America are put in mental hospitals. They're arrested by policemen or whatever and moved, and that's it. Many of them disappear. Well, thankfully, his mother called us, and I heard about it, and when I heard she told me the situation, I said, this sounds crazier than the psychiatrist that committed him. So uh, we argued a case in court, and a judge ruled that he should not be in the mental hospital. He was actually let out. But think about the 1.5 million people in America that go in those and never get out. He called me from the hospital, by the way, that on the Thursday before he got out of the hospital, and said, John, a psychiatrist is trying to force medications on me. And so the psychiatrist was listening on the phone, so I said, the psychiatrist is violating the law. You can't do that. You have to have a court order to force medications on somebody. He didn't want to take psychiatric medications. But that's the way the system works in America. And I actually talked to a former NSA agent and said that in that regard, we're, we're, America's copying the old Soviet model, where if people disagreed with the government or they did a weird painting or wrote, wrote anti-government poetry, they were put in mental hospitals. Think about that. 1.5 million people in America on an annual basis disappear into mental hospitals and then never get out. You're talking about uh, a psychiatrist and medication. Uh, I think around 27 million Americans are on illicit drugs. Yep. And according to the Mayo Clinic, seven out of 10 Americans are on prescription, prescription drugs. Prescription drugs, many of them children. And then if you look at the collusion, for example, how does a congressman get elected? He can be supported by whichever corporate, let's say big pharma, whatever, oh, yeah. can fund his entire campaign. And once he's in Congress, that same person being funded, let's say, by the big pharma, can then amend laws and pass bills and vote for all kinds of things uh, to produce you know, a good yep. result for the big pharma. And that person may even also have stocks in big pharma companies and then obviously uh, amending laws, uh, potentially creating a situation where those stocks rise yes. uh, and get, earn a fortune from that. So when you also add the collusion and the problematic uh, influence from lobby groups, it really speaks for a deterioration of a democratic system. Yeah, it's like I said, it's the Princeton University, Northwestern University study, which showed we're an oligarchy run by a moneyed elite. President Carter agreed with that. But 
Yeah, it basically money does run the show in America, not civil liberties. And that's why I keep saying is the, the key thing to freedom in America is the average citizen out there saying, hey, I'm going to actually stand by the Bill of Rights. I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm going to march down the front of the street. I'm going to get me a group of people. Martin Luther King did that. And the reason people like Martin Luther King was so dangerous to the government is he came to Washington, D.C. He was going to do sit-ins and civil disobedience. And they do not want that, no. But the fact that we have a militarized police today, and George Washington, by the way, the first president of this country, said, do not have a standing army on American soil. We face that. Today, Americans have that. And I have a, people who ask me, could America go into martial law? I say, Look, really, we're under martial law already, if you think about it. They can shut down any city within 24 hours now with drones, helicopters, militarized police who can just swarm. And I've seen it happen. Uh, as a young man, when I was in college, if you went out and did a protest, you might see three or four cops. Today, you see the cops in the helmets, the guns, the riot shields the MRAPs, the mine resistant armor protection vehicles that are surrounding you. And some people don't want to go out on marches today, and I can, I can almost see why, because they say, we're going to get my head beat in, I'm going to get arrested. And I, I've said this before, Martin Luther King would have been shut down early in today's environment. They would have surrounded it, and people would have been afraid to show up. And this really sounds much more like a dictatorship mm -hmm. than a democracy. Look, I grew up in a military dictatorship in Africa. I remember yeah. all those scenes, like you're saying, if anybody it's happening protests. Here in America right? now. But it's just so strange to hear this happening in America. But I would like to say, too, could you sum up real quick for our viewers the sum of the Bill of Rights? Because many say that the changing America from a democracy to a totalitarian or uh, a dictatorship depends on weakening the rights mm -hmm. of individuals and depends on weakening the respect for the Bill of Rights for Civil Liberties, which is such a wonderful yeah. document from the American Constitution, yes. uh, which, which were the founding principles that made this nation yeah. such a great nation. Well, the key is uh, respect for rights and respect for differences. We're losing it in the country today with political correctness. You know, what we're dealing with today is a thought crime, essentially. That's an Orwellian term. And if you have the wrong thought today, you mean you can be sent in, in public schools today, just saying the wrong word could get you sent to the principal. We, and we actually handle cases like that, uh, where we're saying it's called zero tolerance, is what the phrase is used. And you have kids that are afraid to, to say certain words today. Uh, we had a case uh, in Texas where a little boy, uh, his uncle was in Afghanistan. He drew a stick figure. He was in the fourth grade. He's not an artist. Of his, his uncle carrying a, a gun. It was a stick figure gun. He was actually, that was taken away from him. He was sent to the principal for violating the, the school ban on the use of the word guns or the pictures of guns. We have today, I mean, kids will say, there are certain words we can't say in school today. And I asked a group of students, what's some of the words? They said, the G word. And I went, the G word? And I said, can you say it? And they said, we can't say it. I said, can you spell it on a piece of paper? They wrote it out as guns. And I said, how do you talk about that thing that the people in Afghanistan carry? Is it a G or is it a gun? How do you, how do you explain what a policeman carries in America today? Is it a G or a gun? They don't even want to say the word. They're afraid to say the word. And that's what the, the Bill of Rights is all about. It's the right you have free speech. You have the right to say it whether people like it or not, especially the government. You have a right to get out in front of the government building and assemble peacefully and tell the government you don't like what they're doing in large groups if you want. You have a right to walk along the street without a cop grabbing you and searching your packages. You know, But they're doing it today, and people are taking it. But why? Because they, they want security. They're afraid of terrorists. You know, and that's another thing. Fear is a way you can control a people. And you have all this talk about terrorism in America, and many more people get killed by policemen in this country today by policemen than you could even think of getting killed by terrorists. So where's the terrorists today? I mean, you have gun shootings in America, but it's the thing. The U.S. Bureau of Justice, by the way, did a statistical survey and said that crime in America in the last two decades has dropped 78%. 
the average American is not a it's not a crime population. I talk to people who don't lock their doors in this country. They're not afraid of crime. So what's, why do you need all the militarized police? And it goes back, again, I'll say to, there's certain paranoia in government about freedom movements. Uh, if you look at that 2030 video that the Pentagon put out that I've talked about, it's a very paranoid video. Where by, in 10 years, they're saying they're going to have to completely lock down the country. Well, and maybe, I don't think, to be honest with you, it's about what they're saying in the video about the country breaking down economic. It's about freedom movements. When in times of distress, people get out in the streets, and they don't want that. But the First Amendment guarantees it. Yes, and, and this is the most remarkable part of the story, because when you look geopolitically and, and between Russia and the United States, Russia used to be the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. It completely broke down for a number of reasons. After breaking down, so many of the Russians say, my God, we for sure do not want that kind of system again. But they have embraced Christianity. They have removed themselves from atheism. They have removed themselves on the state level from the communist way of thinking. And they're much more, more capitalist today, mm -hmm. which we see in the Russian oligarchs, by the way, yeah. who are billionaires all over the place. It seems that we s we're switching roles. We who watched the Soviet Union fall, now desire to be socialist or communist, group think, group ruling, yeah. uh, dictatorship style. How do we expect this to end differently than the breakdown, as the breakdown did in the Soviet Union, with the surge of freedom yeah. that the people felt there, they could now own property. We're in a total surveillance state. Everything you do is being watched. The local police in this country have watch lists now. They go to the social media and they're looking for troublemakers. They're trying to figure out how, what they're going to do. The Department of Homeland Security does what they call threat assessments on American homes. They run from green to red. If you move up like to yellow, you're being watched very carefully by the federal government as well as local police. So there is a paranoia that, you know, there's going to be some movements in this country, and there may be. It would have to be out of the educational system, however. The educational system is very strong in this country. Even college students coming out. I had one law student tell me that she was so upset because in her constitutional law class, the professor announced at the beginning of the year there was one area of the Constitution they weren't going to study, the First Amendment, and they didn't study it the whole year. When I was in college and law school, the First Amendment was the key thing that we learned, and that's the right to protest, the right to free speech. So they're dumbing down the population so they won't even think about that. And with political correctness, it's just becoming so overwhelming that you can't say certain words. And again, uh, you eliminate thinking if you eliminate speech and thought. And that's exactly what they're doing. And it was predicted by Orwell and others who saw it coming early. In the Soviet Union, they did do that. And we're seeing that model, I think, moving into this country, unfortunately. I'm seeing it everywhere, yes. How can you say such a word, he or she? People are actually debating whether you can say he or she now in America. They don't know what to say, what to call you. And I'm, you know, again, if I want to be called he or she, that's my right. But they don't want you to have that right anymore. They want to eliminate that and make everything the same. And once you do that, again, Hitler was right. You get people in groups, they stop thinking. And do I think the government in this country wants us to think? No, I just, I don't think they want us to think. And we would for certain like to see the reinstated respect for the American Constitution, yeah, it's uh, not which there. easily could be argued to be the best constitution in the world uh, as a system when you look at the civil liberties, the freedom of speech, the respect for diversity, yes. the look upon respect diversity as something beautiful, something God-given, yes. something God-made. Yes. It's a great thing that we yes. have difference of opinion because then we can have what the old Athenians spoke about as a good debate and yes. we can learn from each other Socrates and wrong. expand yeah, yeah. Our, our understanding for one another. And maybe the end point then would be that we would love each other more because Freedom we would is respect in diversity, each other. But diversity has respect everybody else's opinion. And again, I say perceptions can be incorrect. 
your perceptions. And that's why someone can get in and say, hey, what you believe is really stupid. You don't have to yell back and say, well, why, tell me why it's stupid. I want to hear it. And maybe they'll convince you that what you're saying is stupid. Maybe your, your censorship view is stupid. Maybe you need to open up a bit here and let other people speak and preserve freedom in America and around the world, because America, you know, has a great influence on the world. And on that note, thank you so much, uh, John Whitehead, famous author here in America, <laughs> the president and founder of the Rutherford Institute. Uh, and you speak a lot about the, the militarization of America domestically. And uh, we would uh, suggest for everyone to watch you and read what you're writing. And thank you very much for taking out of your precious time to joining us here at the Herland Report. Thank you very much. <laughs>